actually has an inverse. Okay, and then um, you know it, it, this formula, if, if the inverse exists, completely describes delta u the way it changes with delta sigma, like delta sigma on this side, delta u on that side. So this is the full problem for EIT, and of course our game is for lots of values of f. We get lots of delta u's, we get lots of Neumann data for that, and, and then we try and find delta sigma. So this is definitely some progress. Okay, so this is where the technicality comes, that um, we, we need to work in some normed space, and we, at this point we're going to say sigma is an element of L infinity of omega, which means um, the um, absolute value sigma is positive anyway, um, uh, is, um, is finite. Um, so soup means the, the maximum value. S soup means um, it, it's, it, it's, it, its maximum value is finite, but on a set of major zero, a few points or something, it's allowed to go infinity, because when we integrate, we never see that. So if, if we only work in terms of integrals, changing sigma on a line or a few points or any set of major zero just is, is irrelevant physically. So um, we want this to be bounded, um, but on a set of major zero we don't care. So it's a very weak assumption, but th there's another um, implication here that I'm going to use the soup norm to measure how close sigma is. And this is really important in inverse problems because when you solve an inverse problem, you go from the data to the solution. And the data has some error in it. And usually that means that a small amount of error in the data um, can result in very large errors in the solution. Because it depends what norm you work in. Right? If, you, if you have a very tight definition of data being close together using some very strong kind of norm, you've got a better chance of, of getting a less error in your reconstruction, and, and vice versa, right? So, so it matters what norms you, you deal with. And saying that two conductivities are close in the L infinity sense, rather than L2, the sum of squares sense, means that, um, that they're close all the way along. You know, so in an L2 sense, let, let me just kind of draw a picture, that if I had, this is one conductivity, and uh, this is another conductivity, then, well, actually, for the point of view of EIT, if this spike was small enough, we wouldn't really see it. Uh, and, and these would be L2 close, because when we integrate it, we get a very small value there, right? So we just get this distance. Whereas in L infinity, these were a long way away, because the maximum difference is enormous. So, um, saying two things are L infinity close is, is in a way saying they're really quite close indeed. They, they can't have kind of spikes, even tiny spikes where they differ. So, so bear that in mind. Well, now what we want is for this to be small enough that 1 plus it is invertible, because the identity is clearly invertible. And in fact, in, in, if you know a little bit about operators, um, you can think of this as a compact perturbation of the, of the identity in, in the right norms. But in any case, um, uh, it, it's fairly obvious that if you get the identity and add something small enough to it, it's still going to be invertible, right? There's a neighborhood the identity is invertible. So we want this to be small, however way you, you cook it. And so in the appropriate operator norm, <coughs> which if you know about these things, you'll know what it should be, but, but just for the moment, it's a measure of the size of the operator. That's less than or equal to the norm of the operator G, getting the appropriate norm, some sort of <coughs> delta sigma. I won't say what the norms are, but you, you can give them sensible values. Um, and 
the point is that this operator L sigma is a little bit strange because delta sigma can be positive and negative. So this isn't really an elliptic operator anymore. It's a kind of weird thing. Um, but nevertheless, it, it only involves delta sigma as a kind of multiple. So um, if, we, if we bound delta sigma by something, it controls the size of this operator. That's all we need. So in L infinity, it's relatively easy to say that it's less than or equal to uh, norm g of sigma times, well, possibly some constant, c times uh, the norm of sigma in the L infinity norm. Whereas it, it's hard to make that argument. So maybe I should put the c there. Uh, it's hard to make that argument in, in sort of more useful norms, the L2 norms. So what do we want? Well, the thing is, sorry, it's delta sigma, um, that whenever these, these two constants, and they are constants and fixing sigma, that I can make this less than 1 for norm delta sigma, the L infinity norm, less than 1 over. So there is a value of enough, so that when this is small enough, the norm of this is less than 1. And that guarantees that this is invertible. But it's even better than that. It's well, it's well better than invertible. Because in the norm space of operators, I can just write this series, which you might at first think is just a formal series. It's just a series for... Um, 1 over 1 plus x, right? Um, so, minus. sign that because there's a minus there. So let, let me tell you what I've done. That the series for 1 over 1 plus is 1 over 1 plus x is the sum of minus x to the k from k equals 0 to infinity, standard series. Uh, I've got another GL delta sigma, so I've started from k equals 1 and I've got the minus sign wrong I think in that case because the 0 for the term for that is 1 k equals 1, it should have a minus sign, so I think that's right. <coughs> and this converges because the norm of this is less than 1. So it's a convergent operator series. Just, it's bounded above by a series of, of numbers that's converging. Okay, so this tells us a lot about the idea. Yeah. Is that a delta sigma on the right hand side? You've got a delta u on both sides there. Oh, beg your pardon. The, the first term is G sigma L delta sigma, applied to you, right, which is not perturbed. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this tells us a lot about EIT. In, in particular, this is minus G sigma L delta sigma of U plus something that's big O of norm, the L infinity norm, of delta sigma squared. Um, so this is slightly stronger than just saying that this first term is a derivative, which should have little o of delta sigma. But because it's a power series, and it's got a, a radius of convergence, Actually, the next term is order squared. And the point is that each of these terms is linear in delta sigma. There's the only delta sigma, and it goes in, you know, L depends linearly on delta sigma. There's only one delta sigma in it. And so these terms are genuinely first order, second order, third order, and so on. The first term is linear in delta sigma, the second term is quadratic in delta sigma. So not only is this a series expansion, it's actually the Taylor series expansion for delta u in terms of delta sigma. It's an increasing powers of orders of delta sigma. 
Even, even though these are operators, it's still a Taylor series. A Taylor series of operators. Okay, so... Um, in particular, for those of you, that, for the mathematicians, it means that this is actually the fresh A derivative of the thing we're looking at in the normal infinity. So in other words, it's a bounded linear operator and the next order term is, is definitely higher. Um, informally, you get that it's a directional derivative in that direction, um, but uh, this, this proves it's fresh A derivative. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it's actually got a very practical consequence, um, which I'll just pick out a little bit for the moment. Um, because if you take the special case, let's take sigma equals 1, because it's easier to understand, right? Um, so this is an example. Uh, then delta u is equal to minus g sigma, and then L delta sigma will be the divergence of delta sigma grad u, and then plus higher order terms. And so just expanding this, the divergence of sigma grad u is sigma del squared u plus grad sigma dot grad u, just from the product rule for differentiating. Right? So in this case, that's equal to minus g sigma of um, grad delta sigma dot grad u. Time to draw a picture. So let's let's take uh, a nice simple two-dimensional domain, and let's suppose that sigma delta sigma is supported in this small region. Okay. Little, little disk, say. Well, this thing is grad sigma got grad u. So let, let's so, suppose that we've already applied some... So these are the contours of u. We've applied maybe a current here going in there and out there. And so the voltage is going downwards in this direction. So Grad U is like that, maybe that's uphill. Okay. Now delta sigma in in a kind of um, let's just get yeah. so grad sigma dot grad u is the directional derivative of sigma in the direction of grad u. Okay? I mean grad delta sigma dot some vector is a directional derivative in that direction. So what we've got here is the directional derivative of, of this in that direction. Now if, if you take this as a little blob and then take the limit, then the directional derivative of, of, a, of a delta function is a dipole in that direction. So um, obviously